Amen. Jump into Acts of the Apostles with me. Thank you, praise and worship team. Mike Meyer, great to have you back. We know that you've been on loan with another ministry. Thank you for being here and uh, so thankful for the team and the leadership of Pastor Dwayne. Thank you for really uh, just being an example for us to sing along with you in praising the Lord. What a name, the wonderful name of Jesus. Today we're going to start out with uh, a little bit of a review and a little bit of an introduction as we often do and then we're going to get into an introduction of uh, our new series in the Gospel of Luke and so what better way to start than to go into the Acts of the Apostles because they have the same author. Oh, I know the Holy Spirit wrote everything, but specifically speaking, we have a man by the name of Luke, Dr. Luke, and so we're going to look at a little bit of um, who we are, what we're about, and how we landed on this study uh, to go forward here, the Gospel of Luke. There's four of them. I've preached through one of them, studied uh, many of them, taught in the Institute, Gospel of John. And uh, maybe we'll get to Matthew someday, but here we are in Luke. And it uh, should uh, prove to be a wonderful study. The Word of God does never disappoint. And I'm looking forward to that. It says up on the screen an opening here in the, uh, in the introduction. And it's talking a little bit about who we are, the purpose of First Bible. And I'm bringing that to the fore to tie it together to why we're headed to Luke's Gospel. Uh, of course, we are reminded that uh, Luke's gospel is really uh, highlighting and personifying and magnifying Jesus Christ as the Son of Man. We know that, of course, in Gospel of John, he is personified and magnified as the Son of God or, of course, divinity. And we see all the I am statements of Jesus Christ. And, of course, John's gospel's different. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, of course, are regarded as synoptic, and so they have a commonality to them, and uh, there's a lot of, of course, harmony in the Gospels, but Luke's Gospel is uh, something that God has just led us to look at, and if you see the first verse, of course, of, of uh, Acts chapter number one, it just says there, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, and we find out that it is Luke who's speaking of that, and we find out that he is the writer of the Gospel of Luke, of course, as well as it's entitled. So we have this man named Theophilus, and you don't know much about him other than he is someone who desires to know more about Jesus Christ after his conversion. That's all we've got. He's uh, formerly a Gentile. Uh, of course, he's a Gentile, converted Gentile, and so we have a commonality in looking at Luke, but we'll get into that here in a bit. Why is that slide up there. It's a reminder of something that I speak about and bring to the fore every once in a while, just to, again, keep it in front of you. Uh, some of you see this handout in the lobby. It's up on the wall hangers, and, and many of you have these. Some of you have a couple copies. Some of you have lost them. And it, of course, has a calendar, and some people say, oh, I didn't know that you had VBSC. Well, it's in the calendar. And we've been talking about it. And I know a number of you know that it's coming because camp is here and it's time for camp. And there's uh, 240-ish or 50-ish campers. I think we're around that number. We'll see all of those that sign up. There's over 60 workers. And they believe in, as all of you believe in what's up there, to live faith, to love others within the body and to declare hope to those that do not have hope. Or they have a hope, but they don't have a certainty and so they really have not been able to figure out what they really are hoping in. So that is our purpose. And again, it defines in clarity and just quick statements what our mission and our vision and, and all that. So what do I want to do today? Well, I just want to tell you that as we're on pace to walk and to work through the third piece, it comes off of, of course, in Christ alone. I mentioned this back in January to set out a little bit of a vision and a reminder of the In Christ Alone Acts 2 Project vision that 
after our Acts 1A conference. We really take that theme of the conference the year before was our holy calling. And so we work off of that with each year still coming back to the core root of who we are and what we do and why we do what we do. Why in the world do you do camp? Well, it's a place where, again, young people, children, can be ministered to with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Men's softball starts out uh, this afternoon with a couple of games. This is it, men's softball. It's ministering to children there, too. <laughs> slow, slow bunch today. Would you wear them out in the investors today? What'd you do today? You got it cranky, didn't you? Yeah. You think about Mighty Mites and how that's coming up, T-ball and coach pitch, ministering to children, but ultimately to give the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to children and their families, to demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ, to clearly let people know who we believe in and to declare that hope. On Sunday mornings, there's many things that go on. on. During the week, there's many things that go on truly for the glory of God and for the edification of his people to ultimately go out with the mission and know that we have something that is really purposed. So here you are with the Acts 1-8 church. The Acts 1-8 church mission and who we are. It looks, we look at verse number 8 in your Bibles, Acts chapter number 1. You say, well, you say this verse a lot. Yeah, you're getting it. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria. And unto the uttermost part of the earth. It is truly a great statement. And we look at that and say, okay, in Christ alone, the Acts 2 project, what really is though the mission and the core root of it? What is it? Well, this is every church's mission. It's at the end of each one of the Gospels as Jesus Christ declares it and at the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles. And it happens that the Gospel of Luke, writer, Dr. Luke, and the Acts of the Apostles, writer, Dr. Luke, there's a similarity, there's some symmetry, there's some cohesion by the Holy Spirit of God in writing the Word of God. And we're reminded again that we have a mission to accomplish. You go to Acts chapter number 2. Verses 46 through 47, the Acts 2 project, a vision, the vision of God for our church. Off of the mission and the vision, these coming together. Verse number 46, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, let me just pause for a moment. Just, just a moment. I've just read three verses, plus the first verse of the Acts of the Apostles, so four. Verses that you've heard before, verses that you've read in your quiet time, verses that I've preached through, that others have spoken of and preached through. I've heard Bobby preach the gospel and the Great Commission in conferences countless times. And every time, I have to just get right back in there and listen to God and what he's saying. Because you and I just kind of read verses, memorize verses, and go, oh, that sounds good. Oh, it sounds good. But there's more to it than it sounds good. You see, we have a mission and we have a vision. And we have to be reminded. So, Pastor, why are you going to the Gospel of Luke? I'm getting there to remind you that the church collectively and corporately together as the bride of Christ. We're the body of Christ. We have been given an assignment, and it's very important that we just don't scan over it. Is it possible that we do that way too often with so many things? And we, so don't, we just don't find the depth of what God's meaning here. If all these people are really serious, which they are, and these 3,000 souls from verse number 41... They get baptized, they're jumping in, they're ready to go. They are in the doctrine and fellowship of the apostles. They're breaking bread, they're in prayers. It says in 46 that they continue daily one accord in the temple, which means they got together in a gathering place. They broke bread from house to house. 
They also did that from house to house, getting together in fellowship and also breaking into the Lord's Supper too. They did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, which means that they had unity. And they got together over the things that were of Jesus Christ, who just saved their souls. Their life is completely changed. As I often say, this new life changes their whole life and how they're living, and they don't have a Bible to figure out how to do it. All they've got is the preaching and teaching of the apostles who are with Jesus Christ. And they did it. It says in verse number 46 that they were so fired up that they praised God. They were praising God and they having favor with all the people, which means... Very simply, God gave by grace the ability of these people that are in Jesus Christ in the first church, the beginning of the church, to really have God show them how real he is. They're praising God, and what's the overflow? They have favor from God with other people. And then, of course, it says the Lord added to the church. When I break that down for a minute, and then I go back to verse number 8 and go, wow, receive power, Holy Ghost has come, I'm witnesses, and I go everywhere and anywhere, whew, that's enough. But we go a little bit further with our Acts 1-8 church mission, our Acts 2, 46 and 47 project, and our vision, and then we look at Acts 4, go to Acts 4, verses 32 through 33 to look at our direction. This is our focus. What direction am I supposed to go in? We know that what's happened here. In chapter number 4, as Peter and John are arrested, they're threatened, they get out. They said, hey, we, we don't obey the things that are of man. We are after the word of God. We are believing what God's called us to do. They get out. They get together with their peoples. Their fellowship is incredible. They're rejoicing and they're praying. In verse 31 it says in chapter number 4 of the Acts, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. They're fired up. God's done a miracle. They got Peter and John, their leaders, out of jail, out of their their situation that we were with, with the the Pharisaical (laughs) chief mucky mucks that wanted to hold them down from preaching the gospel. Verse number 32 and 33 then comes. The multitude of them that believe were of one heart and of one soul. Oh, the unity. The unity. Luke's speaking by giving an account of what's going on here by the Holy Spirit of God. But Paul wrote the same type of unifying words as the apostle of God. You think one heart, one soul. They had, all of them says that, says that they had out of the things which are possessed were his own, but they had all things common, which meant stewardship. Lordship, it's all his, and we have things common, and we're going to go after this thing. Verse 33, and with great power, gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Oh my, oh my. The great power that the witnesses, excuse me, that the apostles were given allows them to be the witnesses. Now, You, by the Holy Spirit, have that great power. You are compelled, I would hope, to tell people how the death, burial, and resurrection, the gospel of Jesus Christ, gave you a new life. And then, with great grace that's upon you, you go. Because God continues to give you grace. He gives you stuff and gives me stuff that you could never earn. That's his grace. Are we forgetting that sometimes? Sure, we do. We have a tendency to forget the beauty of God's incredible grace and the power that he's given us. Even just the simple thing, sometimes unthankfulness leads to a place of forgetfulness. And they reciprocate back and forth, and I lose my focus. Do you ever lose your focus? Do you ever lose where you're supposed to go? I was joking with the first group at 9 a.m., I said, you know, there's this automatic pilot, and I'm not talking about your car or your phone. It's in your brain. You get in your car, you start it up, and you know you have to go somewhere. Maybe you have to run some errands. You got to get some gas. You got to go to the bank or whatever, but you end up somewhere else. You get in the driveway of somebody's house, and you wonder, what am I doing here? Or you end up at work, and you're not supposed to be at work because it's Saturday. You've got automatic pilot brain. You're stuck. 
Sometimes I come out of my house and I've got to take a left and I take a right and I'm coming up down Adams Dairy Parkway. I show up at the drive. What am I doing at the church building? I know that doesn't happen to any of you. I lose direction. I'm not sure where I'm supposed to be. I lose focus. Spiritually speaking, the same thing happens to us. As a church, we cannot lose our focus. We can't. When it gets a little blurry, we've got to get back to what we're doing and why we're doing it and knowing who we are in him, in the word of God. And that reminds us of our direction because the last piece here goes to Acts 13. I shared this with you back in January. This is really powerful and strong. Acts 13 shows us our passion that we have to advance. We have this abil ability with the church mission, with this project called our vision. We have a focus that gives us a clarity of direction. And now we say, okay, how do we advance? Investors, did you have someone speak in your class this morning? Besides Bobby and Doc. He was skinnier and younger, correct? Maddox Hughes, the small picture of the advance. God's called him, stirred him. I would like to go a little further, God. Okay, how does God orchestrating that with a six-week internship in Honduras with one of the church plants of Vida Nueva? You'll hear more about that next week and how you can be praying for him and be part of that. Why am I mentioning it? Because it's part of what it says in Acts 13. It's a, just a small picture of this. It says, Now there was in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, that was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Lord, excuse me, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas, Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Another passage of scripture that's familiar to you. Well, I've read that and I know what that is and that's not for me. That's for all of us in the church. That's the advance of the mission that moves from a mission all the way through a vision that pulls us through each and every year, each and every month, each and every season, each and every week, each and every day. Say, okay, God, by your word, what's our focus? What's our direction? Then we have great grace and great power, and we know that then the mission can advance. Way beyond me, way beyond you, way beyond any of us. Until Jesus says, it's time for his second coming to fulfill all things. I'm looking at this thinking that, hey, I can read these and read these and again, take them for granted. The word passion means suffering. Will I sign up for the suffering? I signed up a long time ago. A lot of you have signed up. There's nothing wrong with signing up for being acquainted with the Lord Jesus Christ and his sufferings. My point in all this coming full circle is that we walk this thing out by living faith to love others and declare hope. It's First Bible Baptist Church. Why we exist, who we exist in, what we exist for, how we exist daily and on a day-to-day -day basis. And today as we're getting through this and walking through this and saying, okay, this is a good introduction, well, what are we going to be studying? Well, you can imagine if that is paramount in your pastor's vision and heart and praying and studying and reading, then all the other stuff is going to fit in there from the Word of God. So what are we going to do on Sunday mornings? Turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 1. Because we really want to study the Gospel of Luke, a study of Jesus Christ as the Son of Man. So this is, again, just an introduction, just kind of highlighting a few things, giving you a little bit of a prelude to things. We'll get into it a little bit more deeply. But we're going to cover just four verses this morning. Look at Luke a little bit and give you some background of Dr. Luke, the Gentile medical doctor that is writing the gospel and has written, of course, the Acts of the Apostles. A reminder for some of you that love mathematics or maybe the first time that some of you have heard it, Luke 
is credited with writing more verses in your New Testament than anyone else. You say, what about Paul? They're close, they're neck and neck. Well, maybe his verses are longer, that's more words. But we have an accounting, and of course, this is not me counting them all, but looking them up and knowing that when you have good Bible study material, you know it's accurate that you find out that Luke's writing between the two books that he wrote account for 2,128 verses in your New Testament, which is 27%. And Paul's is 2,032. You add those together, you get over 50% of your New Testament. You add, of course, John and what he's written in the Gospels and his letters. And you realize that the Gospel of Luke is so very paramount to us finding out about the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, and more about who we just sung about, just a person of Jesus, the humanity of Jesus. He is divine and perfectly divine, and he's man and he's perfectly man. You say, that's not me, I'm not perfect. You've been perfected and God is perfecting you right now. Or we can just throw away all those verses that talk about him making you perfect. You say, but I still sin, absolutely. But your flesh is no different than his flesh. Your bones are no different than his bones. Brain cells, he might have been a little smarter than you, I don't know. I threw this out at the first, uh, set. some of them, I think they were a little sleepy. I think they were. I said, yeah, he's got the same blood as you, the same blood and the same, and they all go, same blood, I guess that's okay. See, don't believe everything I say, because he had divine blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. His blood is perfect, blood sinless, complete already in his finished work. That's the blood that had to be shed for the sin of all mankind. In order to provide the redemption, by the way, just a quick note, it'll come up much. If all the writers, this one Luke, he speaks of redemption an awful lot in his gospel. The reconciliation, I know Paul speaks of in his letters, but the redemptive power of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. To believe on Jesus Christ, that is Luke's mission here. The author of Luke's gospel is Dr. Luke, of course, companion of Apostle Paul from Acts 16. Please be reminded that this is the most comprehensive gospel that gives us a historical account of the four better than the others. It doesn't mean that it's better, period. It means that the historical account of everything. How did he do that? He didn't, he wasn't one of the first 12. I guess the Holy Spirit had to be involved. I guess that the people that he talked to had to be involved. You ever think it's been told and taught and theologians say it? I don't know if you have read this before that it's a good chance that Luke spent some time with Mary. How would he know the things that went on with Mary and Elizabeth? Well, the Holy Spirit just told him. He's a real living person. He's alive and around in the Acts of the Apostles. He talked to people. Last week we talked about memories, the accounting of a memory of something that Jesus did, and they passed it on. He spent time with Paul. Was Paul there? When Jesus Christ was walking before he, walking on the earth? No, but he had an accounting. Plus, I heard that he went to Jesus' Bible Institute, so I guess that would be pretty good, too. But see, the author of Luke's Gospel, very simply, is Dr. Luke, and I know that you think I'm really smart now that I figured that out, but Paul and Luke has some type of camaraderie here. It says up on the screen, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. The accounting in Colossians 4 has Paul, as he did many times in the end of his letters, talk about some people that are very precious to him. He said in verse number 7 of Colossians 4, All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant. So he spoke of Tychicus, or Tychicus, either way. I don't mind your pronunciation. Either way. He also speaks of Anisimus in verse number 9, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. Who's one of you? He's a man from Colossae. 
who is converted. Is Colossae a Jewish nation city? No. But he's one of you. They got saved, so now he's a faithful brother. Aristarchus. My fellow prisoner saluteth you, Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom you receive commandments, you become unto me, receive him. Jesus, who is called Justice, in verse number 11, who are the circumcision, these are also fellow, labor, fellow workers in the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Epaphus, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you. And he goes down and he says, Luke, the beloved foolish physician, that means he is loved, and Demas greet you. I want to remind you of the relationship that Paul had with Luke. It says in Acts chapter number 16, and there's much here, of course, in this, and I even mentioned this when I taught on the Acts of the Apostles four years ago. And after he had seen the vision, he immediately endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. This is the first time you see Luke speaking in the possessive of relationship with Paul. Understand, he's a Grecian man, a Gentile who is converted, and now he's with Paul. And it says there that he, we he, immediately we endeavored together with Paul, and then it says the Lord had called us What is this called, everybody? The Macedonian what? The Macedonian call. Paul is now being turned in a direction by the Holy Spirit of God to go to preach the word of God, and you sometimes skip over those pronouns, not with the culture that we're living in, but the Bible speaking of the we and the us between Paul and Luke. This is our guy. This is the guy who wrote the gospel. He accompanied Paul. We're finding in Acts 20 and Acts 21 and Acts 27 and Acts 28 that it's the we and it's the us and he accompanied Paul. And as he's mentioned in Colossians, he's also mentioned in Philemon. And here's his last mention right here in 2 Timothy. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee for he is profitable to me for the ministry. In 2 Timothy chapter number 4, the last words of Paul the Apostle writing to the pastor at Ephesus saying, Hey, Timothy, let me tell you a little bit about how things are playing out in my last days, my last hours. And he says to Timothy, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, in verse 9. For Demas hath forsaken me. Demas hath forsaken me, but he mentioned him earlier. Ooh. In verse number 11, only Luke is with me. He mentions Tychicus again. Have I sent to Ephesus the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus? When thou comest, bring with thee in the books, but especially the parchments. He's hoping that he gets a visit from old Timothy, isn't he? You see, the personal interaction of Paul with Timothy, in that comes out the name Luke. This is very real. In the time that we're reading this right there, now we're reading this thing a little less than 2,000 years ago, you're going, wow, they were really after it. Yes, they were. And we have to consider the depth of who this man is, Dr. Luke. Most scholars hold the position Luke was a Gentile. Luke's account of the person Jesus Christ are more detailed than any others. And as I mentioned, the historical account of things that happened, there are, of course, tons of parables in Luke's gospel, many more than, and they appear only once in his gospel. And of course, the medical references, he interjects, they're numerous, one upon another upon another. So we see in Luke so very much this Gentile medical doctor filled with details in his writings of events and parables that other synoptic gospels Matthew and Mark did not include and did not have. That's the way God wrote his word. This is the way, it's not by coincidence, that we have what we have. It says there up on the screen this, the gospel of Luke profoundly and powerfully declares the greatness of the Son of Man, the person of Jesus Christ, as divine and as perfect. That's who he is. So if you just take all that in as an introduction... And we go, we're going to cover these four verses and be done. 
But before that, I want you to consider this question. As a church, I'll be more personal at the end. When we have grasped that Jesus Christ is our living hope, in dwelling in the church, in all of us, as his bride, what should we be compelled to do with that truth? What are you compelled to do with that? Hey, I'll serve in camp. Okay, that's good. I'll serve in going and knocking on doors and inviting people to church. That's good. I like that. I'll help out as an usher in the foyer. I'll, I'll make some coffee. I'll watch the babies. I'll, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm, I'm backpedaling a little bit. That's good. But how do I declare hope? I've got to go to the lost people to do so. Church, if you quite haven't quite figured it out, many of those things that we go after corporately and collectively are not just, oh, let's do it and be done with it. Well, let's just get some camping, some sports, and that's all, and just it's to be in a place where you're around like-minded and brothers and sisters in the Lord that are willing to sacrifice as a living sacrifice to give the gospel to people. To say, hey, I will come and I will collectively partner with you. I will corporately give the gospel and declare hope with other people that believe what I believe in Jesus Christ. I'll do that. Whatever part and piece I can. You know what my hope and prayer is all the time when I say it to you? That it will then overflow into your life personally. That you'll have testimonies, you'll have memories, and not that you just made memories, but that you pass on memories. Last week I talked about that. We need to declare that God is at work. We need to give the testimony of the Lord. We need to tell everybody that he is our hope. And maybe you today feel as though you're not in a place of hope. Lost hope a little bit. This is a good way to just kind of reverse all that and go, you know, I know he saved me. I know that. I know because every time I get alone with him and I fight through that time to be alone with him because I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. He's going to kind of be heavy on me, but then he's going to be, and then I'm going to praise him and then and I got to make some things right and I'll say, oh, Father, you are holy. And, and, I, and, I'll, and then I'm reminded of what you've done for me that I have hope. And then I can go tell somebody, you know, I, I came to know Jesus Christ as my Savior when I was 24 years old. It changed everything in me. In July of 1983. And I, I just, I was hopeless. And now I have hope. And I've lost my way with the Lord. I, I've had some tough days and tough times. Some bad things have happened. I've fallen away from God. I've shook my fist at God. I said, God, I don't want to do this anymore. And then God got a hold of my heart again. And God restored the joy of my salvation in my life. And he told me and reminded me that he can create in me a clean heart when he saved my soul years ago. And now I need to declare that hope to someone. You see, everyone gets to a point where you want to backpedal. Everyone that's a follower of Jesus Christ, like Luke and Paul and John and all of them, it says that Demas was spoken of in a good way, and then it was Demas forsook him. That John, Mark, and Paul did not get along for a period of time, and they separated, but it says at the end of his life he wanted him to come see him. God can put a lot of things back together. And one of the things he can do for you and me when he puts things back together, believer in Jesus Christ, is cause you to go declare hope to someone. Why didn't you ever tell me this before? Because I kind of I kind of got messed up for a while, lost my way with the Lord. But he's restored me. He's put me back together. He saved my soul. And now I know that I'm compelled to tell you about the hope that Jesus Christ can give you and change your life forever. This is Luke's gospel. This is what Luke does. With all that being said, 
we land on this simple statement. Make hope known. That'll be the name of our series in the Gospel of Luke. We might be in it for a little while, but that's okay. God's got plenty to teach us, lessons that we need to learn. I heard that the definition of a disciple is learner, so let's be learners of Jesus Christ. I remember one of the verses that struck me so strongly years and years and years ago was that old statement that was made after Jesus Christ went to see the wee little man, and the wee little man was he. Remember Zacchaeus? And I'm not talking about the Caesar's son. He's not we. But it says in Luke 19 that when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to the guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and I have taken anything from, my man, from any man by false accusation. I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto them, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is son of Abraham. And verse number 10 in Luke 19 says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. We'll return to that verse an awful lot during our series because in this study of the Gospel of Luke, Luke really clearly breaks down that Jesus Christ, as the Son of Man, really wants people to be redeemed. He wants people to know that the facts of Jesus Christ's existence are real and you can believe on him without doubt. Let's read four verses. Luke chapter number 1. I'm going to give you some our words, one for each verse, and I'll be done. Follow along, Luke chapter number 1, verse number 1, 2, 3, and 4. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most assuredly believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, I seemed good, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. Verse 4, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things, wherein thou hast been instructed. Four verses. The opening words of Luke's gospel. Some highlights, some thoughts. When he, Luke, writes this, he comes again from the place that God wants him to know what he needs to put down. He needs to make relationships. He needs to record things. He needs to make sure that he researches. He needs to make sure that this is revelation of God. It can't be his own writings. It can't be his own accountings because he doesn't have the accountings personally. It's powerful to think of how God orchestrated his word and that it's all scripture given by inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine. It's inspired by God. That prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Every word that you're reading. And so as Luke is writing this down, you know. It's divine. If you thought of others that it could be, hey, he's different than Paul, but he's similar in a lot of ways. Paul's a Jewish man that had Lois and Eunice and a background in the Old Covenant, knew enough. Even Paul told Timothy, don't forget about what you were taught. But then Saul gets converted. He is Paul the apostle, and he writes incredible stuff for the church to understand Jesus Christ. Well, here's Luke, the Gentile medical doctor, who comes to know Jesus Christ, and he's writing Luke's gospel, his own gospel, and he's writing the Acts of the Apostles, and you're going, wow, how did he do this? Well, the first thing is, in verse number one, he had a relationship. How do you know he had a relationship? As many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. There's that personal pronoun of us. So it says relationship. It is not by words of self-decoration, but it is, excuse me, it is not by words of self-decoration or opinion, but it is truly of the relationships that he had with us. The us are other believers. He was able to find out 
things that were going on through relationship. It started with relationship. The us refers to all believers. Some of you love order in life. You love to have things set in order. You love things to be, hey, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning. I'm going to write everything down that I'm going to do, and I'm going to do that. Well, this Luke gospel is probably for you then. Because as Luke says, as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. It's through relationship. Of course, a relationship with the Holy Spirit of God and a relationship with other believers to find out what was going on in Jesus' life. It is not by words, again, of self-decoration or his opinion. He's just, hey, it's listening to the people that were really there to hang out and find out what happened. How did Paul find out things? You see, the Gospel of Luke contains things that aren't in Matthew or Mark. You say, well, then it had to be the time he wrote those things and just made up some other stuff. Really? Luke has this incredible accounting of the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. No one else has it. We'll get into that over the next couple of chapters. It's an incredible record of a medical doctor talking about how an obstetrician works. It's incredible to see that it's by relationship. It's by his interaction. Of course, most of all, from the Lord God on high. Verse number one tells us that Luke did not write this by his own self-opinion, his own self-declaration, but a declaration by others of the things which are most surely believed among us. Verse number two. Even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. He first had to have the relationship to start things, but secondly, he had to do some research. What do you do when you need to know something? Do you do any research? Do you get alone with God? Do you ask somebody that knows the Bible more than you? Do you get in a place where you can take an institute course and get deeper? Do you say, hey, I'd like to learn the doctrines of the Bible? I mention this so often. Till I'm blue in the face. You have to do research because writing this is not by a witness of personal observations or accounts. Did you see what Jesus Christ himself did? You there 2,000 years ago? You were not. So you have to do research. You have the ability to research what Luke wrote. But Luke's not researching what Luke wrote. Luke is writing it. But he has to research. He has to not just have the relationship with people and say, hey, hi, hi, nice to meet you. Da, da, da. Can I ask you some questions? Can I talk to you about this man named Jesus? How is it that you and I just kind of discount what's going on here and just blow over the top of it? It's incredible to show how Luke himself was so personal in relationship with the people that are labeled us. In verse number one. But he also says, us in verse number two. Even as they delivered them unto us. Delivered them. What's the them? Those things which are most surely believed. The believers are talking about what they believe. And it was delivered them unto us. The things that are declarations of what Jesus Christ did. Not by his eyewitness, not his witness of personal observations and accounts, but from us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Who was a minister of the word and was there from the beginning? Who was there giving birth to the baby? I heard. You think she knew what was going on from the beginning? That's a great way of us realizing in the setting here. We'll get into the depth of it, but we realize what Luke is saying. He didn't write it without having relationship with other believers, and he didn't write this gospel without having research because he didn't have a personal witness, which leads to verse number three. It seemed good to me also comma, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, 
to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. You are someone who's an inquisitive believer. You want to know the things about Jesus. Well, I'm going to make sure that I have the right things in order to tell you the truth. So, here's how this goes. The relationship leads to a place of asking questions. And then when you get the questions answered, what do you do? You record the answer. Some of you don't ever write down things. I don't know how you remember anything. Well, that goes back to it. You don't remember anything. That's not fair. I'm sure all of you here have a great memory. You record the answers. Here's Luke. It is not by writings of misunderstanding or vanity, but rather, what is it called? Verse 3, what kind of understanding? Perfect. Oh, my Having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first. And he did it in order and he put everything down. He recorded things. This is real life here. Sometimes we just read and go, oh, it's the Holy Spirit. I know it's the Holy Spirit, but listen to me. This is a real person like you and me writing the things about the person of Jesus Christ. He is the Son of Man. And he has never walked with him in his life. And yet he knows what to write down. That's powerful. So you have to have some relationship. You need to do some research. And you need to record things. Of course, again, God supersedes and is over all of that. But do you not know that this man spent time with Paul? But Paul didn't have any time to spend exactly personally with Jesus Christ. Other than the fact that Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. And after that, of course, they spent some time together. But how do you find these things out? Do you have conversations like that with your brothers and sisters in the Lord? I'm not asking you to rewrite a gospel. We don't need that. We just need to take the gospel off the pages and go, wait a minute. Here is Luke saying that he set forth in order a declaration of those things. That he grabbed them as they were delivered unto us from the beginning from the eyewitnesses. And then in verse 3 it says that he had perfect understanding of all things from the very first. And so after he got them, the Lord Jesus Christ did this. By the Holy Spirit I write this down. O Theophilus, grab it. Because verse number four comes to complete fruition here. After he has relationship, he researches, he regards things, not by his own writing and misunderstanding, but rather complete, perfect understanding. Verse four, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. The certainty. He's completely certain of these things, which means it is revelation from God. It is complete certainty. You don't have to doubt it one single bit. But just think of this man who's writing this gospel. How could he give an accounting of such things? People must have doubted him, wouldn't they? How did you know that Jesus did that? The other R word is revelation. It is not by wonder. Oh, I wonder what he did. It's not by wonder of uncertainty or ignorance. It says there that it's by certainty. Know the certainty. You who read this will know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed because I was instructed with all certainty by the revelation of God. By God putting the exact people in place that he had to do in order for Luke to write this accounting. Ah, uh, Holy Spirit wrote it, that's fine. Blah, blah, blah. You're discounting the life of a precious man who followed after the things of the Lord. Just like you. And just like you. And just like you. When you speak of the things of the Bible... When you speak of the things of Luke and Paul and John and all those things, where do you come from? A place of ignorance and a place of uncertainty? No, you can count on every single word of God to be true and to be right. So why would you not tell people that's where you got it from? Oh, I just want to wax eloquent and tell everybody how smart I am. You'll get tripped up in that. You and I will. What if Luke just said, well, I heard some things and I wrote them down. No, this is from the revelation of God. After recording the things that God would have him record right here. 
to have him then know that off of the relationship that he had to ask some questions and do some research. And this is our medical doctor, Luke, teaching us through his gospel that God ordained and anointed through his pen. Again, as I said earlier, Luke had all of his knowledge from the Holy One, just as Paul had all of his knowledge from the Holy One. And you and I have all our knowledge from the same place. You have this beautiful word. You don't have to have uncertainty. You don't. I don't have to be in a place of ignorance. I can learn and grow. When we have grasped that Jesus Christ is our living hope, indwelling in us is our personal Savior. Remember I had down the bride of Christ, the church? When you and I now personally, I said I would come back to this a few minutes ago to be personal. Indwelling in us is our personal Savior. He is your Savior today. What should we be compelled to do with that truth? Give hope to other people? Be alongside of people to help them move from one step to another? To see people that are hurting, that are in need, that need Jesus Christ? Is that not who Jesus Christ was and is? As the Son of Man, he lived a life that you and I need to model more. He is the essence. He is the one that compels us because he's indwelling in you and me as believers. And we need to let him have all the compartments of every bit and piece of us so we are then compelled to do something with that truth. Tell people. Declare would you please bow your heads for a word of prayer as we head into our prayer time and our invitation? I'll ask you a quick question before I pray, so maybe I could pray for some of you. Maybe today you're saying, hey, pastor, I, I don't have any hope because I'm lost. I have no hope in what's going to happen to me when I die. I've never trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior. And I just... I just sense I'm, I'm missing out on that hope. Hope of being saved and redeemed. If you're like that today, you're lost, I'd like to pray for you. I, I won't come to your chair. I won't. I promise I won't embarrass you. But I'll pray for you. If you're like that and you are lost, you have no hope in Jesus, would you slip your hand up real quick so I can pray for you? Well, then I'm going to pray for all of you who are believers today that you have hope and maybe you can answer this question with the Lord when you've grasped that Jesus is your living hope and he's indwelling in you. What would you be compelled to do about it? Father in heaven, this is our time with you and now we can respond in a deeper way as we pray in the name of Jesus, our Father, and by the power of your word and the spirit of God, I pray that you'll work in this time of prayer and invitation. Please, God, by your word that's been spoken and preached, you may today compel someone to do something with the truth and the reality of Jesus Christ in us, in our church, in the work that you've called us to do. Have your way in this time of invitation and prayer in Jesus' name. Please stand.